Hello. How's that? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right. Okay. Do you want introducing? I shall introduce you. This is Tobias, who's going to talk about building interfaces from the future. So, hello, everybody. Um, as I said, I'm going to talk to you about super awesome interfaces from the future, and not just what those interfaces are, but also how we could go about building them. Because as Jakob alluded to, it's not so easy. So for those of you who weren't at Jakob's talk, I'm going to super briefly make the case why animation is the future, or at least the starting point for the future. And um, I think just to super quickly sort of go through this, I think there is this notion that animation is kind of, you know, it looks nice, it mm, you know, can have some tangential benefits, but it's not like a core important thing um, in your interfaces. And it's something that you can just like do roughly at the end. And I think that can be true if you want to treat it that way. But I think a more useful way to think about it is just adding the dimension of time to your interface. So usually when you design an interface for a screen, you have two dimensions, maybe a little bit of depth, two and a half. But if you add time, you have a whole extra dimension. Between every two states of your interface, you have a whole like 60 or 120 frames per second to like tell the user things. And that can be really powerful. And just like a super simple example from GNOME, if you switch workspaces, so you click a workspace and you switch to another one, this is what it looks like without animations. And you're not quite sure what happens. You have to like first look, wait, which, which one is this? And then you look at the little thumbnails and then you figure out, oh yeah, it's the up, like I switched to the upper one. If we have the same thing with an animation, this is what it looks like. You know immediately that thing is below this thing and then even without the visual aid, you can just use the keyboard shortcut to switch up, switch down, and it just gives you a sense of space. And this is just, I mean, if you've been here for Jakob's talk, you know this is one of many things that you can do with animation that's really powerful and really awesome. So that's animation. As with everything that's really powerful, with great power comes great responsibility. And there are some cases where, you know, it's not quite so great. Um, the typical case is it's slow. This is a great example for Mac OS. Um, when you want to add a workspace, which by the way, you have to do manually there. They haven't quite you know, caught up to us yet. Um, you click that weird plus button there, and there's a full two second animation for the thing to move to the other side. And during those two seconds, you can't actually click the button again. So if you want to quickly add five workspaces or something, like you just go to wait two seconds every time. It's, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, but this is kind of the obvious case. There is a much more subtle case. And that's animations that look okay on the surface, but then when you sort of look at them in a larger context, it's really confusing. And this is kind of my favorite example because it's so ubiquitous. So on the iOS home screen, if you click an icon, what happens um, is like it zooms in, and you see all of the other icons are around your app now, like because the icon transforms it into the interface, right? So now you're in the app and you know there's stuff all around me and you kind of, you've, we've established a sense of space. Except then when you go to multitasking, what happens is you zoom back out and now you're somewhere else. And like there's other apps there and the icons that you knew were there are gone. And if you scroll all the way over there, there's another home screen inside your home screen. It's like really great. Um, but I mean, not to pick on Apple, but like this is one of these examples where I think it's kind of indicative of a process of designing software that has been around for such a long time um, that we've, we're not really questioning it. And I don't know how they got to this decision, but it's probably because they were thinking about screens. Um, they were thinking about this screen transition to that screen, and then that screen transition to this screen, and not looking at them as kind of like a whole connected system. And this is what I call screen-based thinking. The, the kind of notion that we're just, we just got to first design all our screens and then connect them. And that works fine if it's 1997 and you know, you're designing GNOME 1 <laughs> and your computer is like, I don't know, it doesn't probably have, even have a graphics chip. Uh, you're, you're not going to do animation, so it doesn't really matter. It's fine if you just design all your screens and then like, if you click, okay, stuff disappears, other stuff appears, whatever. Problem is, when you start adding animations, you have like a second step. First you design your screens, and then you decide how to animate between them. And that's where things get confusing, because now you're like, well, we got to transition those screens somehow. What's easy? Let's just have it fade. 
or let's have it slide in from the right, or something. And that's when you, how you end up with stuff where the first thing establishes something, and then the second animation just totally breaks it. And that gets really confusing. And I think the sort of thing to realize here is that if you animate things, you're gonna have to contend with space. And no matter what you like think while designing the interface, space is going to be a thing. And so um, this kind of idea of sort of embracing this and kind of evolving sort of the, the process of, of designing software to where we, we actually make use of this fact has been with me for a long time and I've sort of tried to figure out like what a good way forward would be, would be. And about two years I sort of started making it more concrete, writing it down. And that um, ended up becoming an article for Alista Part that I wrote with a friend of mine um, about a year and a half ago. And in this article we sort of diagnosed this very problem um, and then sort of line out, like outline a, a kind of solution or like a path forward. And the path forward as, as we outlined it is more or less this. Instead of thinking about screens, you think about the things on the screens. You think about components. And those components should have meaning and they should have a position at any moment in time. So um, when you actually compose your screens, like the visual rectangles that are visible, um, you take the components that have different states and that can change over time, and you put them in those screens together, and then the transitions are always going to make sense because they're part of the components. And so that's sort of the, the fourth point, like you avoid the contradictions kind of by default. And we call it semantic animation, first of all because it sounds cool, and second of all because like meaning is really at the core of all of this. Like every element in your interface has a meaning, and then it just moves or like morphs or you know changes state, but it's always this, this kind of semantic unit. And if we look at the same kind of process that we've seen before, this is how it looks now. So instead of first designing your screens and then connecting them, you design your components first, and you decide what states your components have, and then it like totally doesn't make sense to just like have stuff slide in from somewhere else because it's already there. You just want it to expand to be bigger, or you I don't know want to like move from from a menu bar to a full screen menu. But it m just makes sense to go from the small unit to the big unit, kind of in place without a second representation of it. And so like just looking at an example here. This is an old example from the material design guidelines from Google. They don't use it anymore, but it's like just the perfect example for this, so I'm using it here. Sorry, Google. Um, so basically what we have here is a list interface where you have a bunch of images, and then you click and click each of them, and then you see the image in like a bigger kind of, um, like you see a bigger image and a bunch more information. And this is what it looks like. You click the image and it just slides in from the side. As you can see, like each of those images is in that interface twice. And there is no real connection between the list item and that, that second pane. And you really wonder like what is the spatial model here? Like is there a huge stack of detailed screens there on the right and you know, whenever you click something the right one slides in? It's like quite complicated. Especially if you look at this example, which essentially does the same thing if you think about it. It's a list of items that you can see a little bit more information about and you can click them to do that. So here you click one of these cards, and all that happens is the other cards slide away, and it's revealed that that information was there all along. And maybe at first it seems like, wait, that's not the same thing, but in reality you could totally do that with the other one as well. So um, I think it's just a way of thinking that sort of treats um, units of meaning as kind of the, the core part of your interface. And then just you have different states of those that you transition between and instead of basically thinking about screen transition, you just think about things changing over time. Because that's how stuff happens in the real world also. So basically to just sum this up, instead of designing a bunch of screens, we're designing a bunch of components and then putting those components into screens. Um, and that way we avoid the contradictions. So I think over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of progress in this area. Like examples like the Apple one are few and far between nowadays. I remember in the old days with stuff like where on Tumblr you would click the menu and stuff would 
sort of animate in from the bottom and then go out on top and then come back in on the bottom. And you don't really see as much of these kind of like just sloppy things anymore. Um, but I think the reason why it hasn't quite taken hold as much as I would like to is that it's really hard. So the second part of my presentation here is about how. How do we like do this kind of stuff? Because it's really cool to be like, yeah, we're going to animate everything and everything's going to be semantic and all that stuff. But in practice, you have to implement it somehow, and it's really difficult. And I know because I've built a lot of hacky prototypes trying to do it. Um, so, but I think what's important is to realize that we're sort of in this transitional, transitional period now where in the past we didn't have the hardware to do animations and so we had processes that accommodated that. And now we have the hardware but all of our processes and also our like APIs and stuff haven't really evolved to that yet. And so if we're sort of starting, if you sort of want to, want to think about like what the, an API from the future would look like, um, maybe it makes sense to look at a case study and sort of assess what is really difficult right now and how this could sort of be addressed. <laughs> so um, this is a demo I built for a, like a touch table. It was like this, this large touch table that the, and the idea was that you would sort of be at a restaurant and you could see the food before you order it, just like this, this menu here. So um, there's the different categories. And then you can essentially just drag stuff, like you would just take the plate and order it by, by dragging it to this area here. And as you can see, these plates are semantic components. So they have all of their state contained within them. Like that extra dialog comes from behind the actual, the actual <laughs> picture. And you can drag them here and this has a meaning, like the, the position also has a meaning here. Um, and then you can click order and then the whole interface moves to this ordered state, but you can still see this. And this is kind of just like a test case for a lot of these ideas, or like this was a test case for a lot of these ideas for me at the time. Um, and I, I think it, it, um, it shows a lot of the kind of complexities that you encounter when you want to design these component-based interfaces. So if we look at this dish component, it looks really simple, but it actually has five different states. Um, like first when it's invisible in the middle before it's actually like spawned to the grid, then when it's on the grid, then when you drag it, that's active, then when you drag it to the ordered area, and finally if you click it, then it's the dialog thing. And each of those states has different constraints and it, it gets complicated even for this simple kind of stuff. And then on a layout level, um, basically those, um, those menu sort of categories slide horizontally and then you have a, a vertical movement for the ordered or not ordered state. Um, so what was hard to do? Oh yeah, first of all, like I built all of this in web technologies, which is maybe also not the best stack to do it, but I think a lot of the difficulties that I encountered there hold for other technologies as well. Um, because basically what you do in most technologies nowadays is you define a bunch of layouts in XML files, and then you have imperative code sort of like animate this to that or something, but you don't really have a good way of, of managing complex kind of um, types of state um, within interfaces. Because we are used to this like paradigm of um, one screen, one screen, one screen, and everything separate. So the first thing that was really difficult here was like just managing the states. And not just like managing the data and, and the interface, that, that, like that's a whole separate thing, but just basically mixing um, interface code and, and like application code and sort of like half the actual like logic that describes the interface is, is in code now because technical constraints. So that in itself is a huge mess. Um, transitioning between stuff, same thing. Like most of the actual like stuff describing what stuff looks like ends up being in JavaScript. Um, another really difficult one was the thing where like when stuff moves off the carousel onto the ordered area, it can't move with the carousel anymore. So you need to add it to a different kind of parent element. And that's not really possible to animate. So basically what I ended up doing is just like clone <laughs> stuff to a separate layer and then manually it there, which huge hack obviously and super unmaintainable. And then I wanted to do some interactive animation stuff where like you can drag stuff from its original position and then it scales depending on the distance. But I gave up on that because it was too hard. <laughs> and so in an ideal world, like what, what, how could this be easy, right? 
So I think for the state management thing, an obvious solution would just be have would just to have like a state machine for every component. We have like these are my five states, these are my transitions, and then you just define that declaratively and later are like go from this to that, and it's already defined, and that would like solve half the problems right there. Um, have basically object connectivity built right in for the transitions, where like go from this to that, and then just scale this image to a bigger image without having to like yeah have multiple representations and stuff. Then to solve the reparenting thing, I honestly don't know a good way to do it, but maybe like, well, I think th the important thing is stuff should be able to freely move between different types of constraints. If it's constrained in this list view here and then later in this grid view there, it should be, I should be able to just have it like seamlessly transition between those two things. Um, maybe like a hierarchical model is not the best for that. Maybe like something constraint based would be better, but yeah. I think that's definitely still up in the air. And then um, for the interactive animation stuff, it would be great to have some kind of way to have properties that are mapped to each other, where you like have this input and then just map something to that input, so like it scales based on that. Um, so that that's kind of like my basic roadmap of stuff that I would like. So um, let's look at some practical examples of APIs that sort of do this. Um, the first one is a library for React. I'm not sure if you're familiar with React, but basically it's like a library to declaratively sort of just render an interface, where you have a hierarchy of components, you just pass it some data, and then it renders the whole thing. And then if you later change that data, you don't have to like do it all manually, it just re-renders the whole thing. And this is a library where essentially it creates these things called frames, which are two different states for the same component. And all you do is essentially just give two things in those two frames the same ID, and it'll automatically animate between them. So like if you have this circle that's first small and then big, you just give those two ovals in the different states the same ID, and it does it automatically. Um, this is super easy and like kind of easy to reason about, but it's not very powerful. Um, so for a lot of stuff, you would probably need a more, more complex API. Um, but I think it's, it's a great start, and like, the fact that it's so easy to think about, um, I think, is, is very important. Um, this is an example from React Native. Like, this whole, this is a gross oversimplification. Like, yeah, <laughs> I just want to point that out. But to basically explain the basic idea is, instead of um, putting values in your templates, you just put a, a variable in there. And then um, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff because you just, it's just JavaScript. Um, and, and you can fade, basically, stuff by, by changing these variables over time. And this is a very powerful API. You can do all sorts of like crazy sequencing things, and you can do spring physics and DK and everything. Um, but it's not super intuitive, and I think for a lot of people, like just to make a simple app, this, this is beyond what, what should be necessary in terms of effort. Um, and then the third example is actually a prototyping tool. It's called Framer, and they have a Mac app, but there's also a JavaScript library, which you can use independently. And um, they have this CoffeeScript, pretty nice syntax. And I think they strike a good balance in terms of like the kinds of abstractions that they have, where um, here, basically, you have these, um, these two different states. You have a, a kind of a concept of states there, and you just define your properties, and then it will automatically animate between them. Um, and then, in addition to that, they also have um, for more complex behaviors that are not just like a click where you need to map stuff, you have um, these primitives for like scroll and like drag and, and pinch and stuff um, that actually solve, I think, a lot of the more common cases relatively easily. So I think in terms of like a good balance, this is maybe a direction to look at. Although this is made for prototyping, so what they assume that you just have a bunch of PNGs that you might want to move around. So I think with more complex structures and stuff, this would probably, yeah, th there would probably be some issues there. Um, but I think looking at these, I, at least I sort of get an idea of what a possible um, cool API from the future could look like. Um, so let, let's, let's talk about that. Um, what, what are the kinds of things that sort of seem to be figured out in other places, and how could we reuse them? I think the first important thing here is that that React style kind of just declarative rendering 
makes a lot of sense for this. Not just for this, there are also other, lots of other issues that, that it solves and that's why everybody seems to be using it these days. But also for this animation stuff, just having these components and then just having each component have a bunch of states that are just a state machine, I think that makes a lot of sense. And then having transitions between those states that just automatically transition the actual object to the new values also makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and I think with those kinds of things, like with those, with those three points, we s already solve a lot of the problems. If we want to go further than that, um, if we were to do something like, like Framer does with primitives for very common interactions, I think that would, like those things would probably solve the majority of use cases. Beyond that, there's a few open questions that personally I don't really know the answer to. Um, first, there's the reparenting thing because um, that's kind of inherently problematic because you're moving stuff from one template, template to another. And so you don't want to mix your nice declarative templates with like imperative code. And so, like, I mean, but then again, um, I'm a designer, so like, yeah. If anyone has, has an idea for that, please. Um, I think for, for very complex behaviors, there should be some kind of low-level API that maybe complements the simple primitives um, where it could look something like the animated values API from React Native because that is very flexible and people use it to do very, very complex things. And yeah, in general, I think maybe the interplay between say the high level and the low level API, how would that work? Um, because obviously y you don't want to break your super nice declarative setup um, in, in, the, in the cases where like, okay, but we really want this, this super fancy transition. So. It, there's a lot of stuff to be figured out there, and I'm not the guy to figure it out because, again, I'm not an API designer. I'm just somebody looking at a bunch of examples being like, hey, can we maybe do something like this? Um, which brings me to my next point. Why am I here, right? Um, why should GNOME care about any of this? And I think Jakob sort of alluded to it. Um, GNOME, I think especially like since the, the 3.0 release, really has been ahead of sort of everybody else in this area. I think still now it's the desktop that uses animation, well, GNOME Shell, I'm not talking about GTK here, um, except for recent developments. Um, I think GNOME really has made amazing use of animation in the past and has really pushed the boundaries of, of how you can use it in a, in a functional way. And I think pushing that forward and making it easier for developers would definitely be in, in that same vein. With all of the work happening in JDK now, I hear like animation is going to become like much more performant and easier to do in GTK. So maybe thinking about an API that also makes it more accessible to developers would also be relevant. And finally, um, everybody else is doing it. And you know, like everybody's on their phones 24 seven and their phones are like animating everything 120 frames a second. And um, yeah, I mean, as I said, Google and Apple are well, as we've seen, they still have a lot of shitty stuff that they need to fix, but they are fixing it. And so long term, this is probably something that we're one going to do. And so why not do it now? So with that said, again, um, like I'm just a designer who sort of looked at some examples and sort of built some prototypes. Um, I'm not the one who will figure this out, but I would be very excited to talk about anyone, uh, to, talk to talk to anyone here who is interested in this, and um, yeah, let's build the future. Thanks. Uh, also, um, if you want to like, get the slides, maybe if you're interested in some of the examples, that's the link. Um, and if there's any questions, let me know. Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone can think of a question, there might be points in it. I have good news. Um, the things that you find are pain points. Uh, I mean, you're, you're right on. Uh, I went through all of them as well. So uh, libdazzle has a state machine you can use for widgets. Oh wow! It has property blending you can use with different easing curves. It will synchronize okay. to the frame clock. Um, it's just it's basically clutter animation. There are um, 
some caveats we need to deal with in the process of using them in GTK. Uh, in terms of like moving the reparenting issue, the trick that I use generally is to take a snapshot of the widget and then I draw it on the top level during the transition. Yeah, that's what I ended up doing. And then, yeah, once I get to the new place and it's like over the new one, then I like hide it atomically while bringing the, right. the widget back in. And generally, I, I think that actually covers like a good 80%. And the reason for that is that um, when you're doing these transitions, the content that needs to be visible is the, it's the most important piece, which means it's always the top. Right. So like, you can bring in other components and hide other components as long as the the like content in which you're trying to present is the top. It's easy to just mm. like fake it. Right. Um, but that said, the the state machine can be used from Glade files, mm. and so it's very convenient because you can just um, put the property bindings in there multiple times like you normally would in the Glade XML. Um, but what you keyed on that it doesn't do yet that I'll, I'll add today or something, which is the automatic property transition. Today, it would just atomically switch it when you switch states. Oh, but okay. we could say, like, animate equals true right. or something, right? And um, it's not a perfect implementation of the things that you want, but it's, like, enough for us to play with and see what breaks next. That's awesome to hear. Great. Uh, one more question, if anyone has one. Or we can finish up and... Ah, okay. Thanks. Uh, it sounds like instead of windows in workspaces, we want a zooming UI for all the windows, so they're all laid out, and then you zoom out to look at them, which is a bit like what the overview does. But then when you close the overview, they all go back behind each other. Uh, I'm just trying, I'm trying to think how, how to apply all of these principles to the, the shell and the overview UI, and it, it's um, daunting. <laughs> As in, just to think of how it would look and how it would right. work. Well, I mean, Any ideas? I, I, I think it's important to sort of realize that, you know, abstract ideas always mm, get sort of watered down a bit when yeah. you put them into practice. And I think Gnome Shell is actually doing an awesome job at, all, at almost all those things. There are a couple of visual things that I am I'm, I'm a little bit bugged by. W one of them is, is like the, um, when, when Windows animate like from one workspace to the other, there is actually like a frame where they're visible, and then on top and on bottom, they on, the, on the bottom they just become transparent, mm -hmm. and that breaks the spatial paradigm a little bit. Just putting that out there. Uh, but no, I think like GNOME Shell actually already does a great job at this, especially <laughs> compared to Windows and Mac OS. Um, but yeah, there's always more work to be done. But personally, I'm more interested in like the application side, um, because that's where there's a lot more work to be to be done right now. I think. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Tobias. <laughs> and we now have a break. You can refill with tea and coffee, etc.